our histories are powerful. As we are affected by the telling and retelling of a story. Yet power is not always akin to truth. We should be wary of words that are used often, though are void of much action. Imagine instead, allowing the truth that can be found in the compassion of the soil, in the abundance of the trees, in the depth of the valleys that echo, in the purpose of the rivers as they carve themselves over stone. Imagine reconnecting to the silent sound of life whirling on within us, the nature of that which is lived and cycled and sacred. Reflect on everything that has been made possible here. Imagine acknowledging what the land has been made to endure, forced to carry the secrets we've held that are now buried and cold with a fiery rage. Give thanks for its capacity to extend forgiveness and grace. Imagine how this land carries the immensity of the stories we've told. There is so much wisdom in the sounds and history of the earth. Listen and hear how the winds can speak calmness into our hearts and cause us to become billowed all in the same breath. There is so much wisdom to be known. May we find the strength to humble ourselves and the faith to listen, to discover how we may reconnect to the soul. It's a privilege for someone to share their story with me. You know, that's private. That's something that affects them. And to share that with me gives me knowledge. It gives me wisdom. And it gives me an understanding of, you know, I really want everyone to understand that we need to stop and think about how we interact before we react. I cannot believe how brave and strong some people are. Letting me be a part of that journey or even letting me know about that journey is an honor. You hear stories about generational trauma and you can never fully understand it even when you hear the story. You can't fully understand it. I think it initially began because of the stress on the ER system and the OD crisis. So folks came together and thought, how can we offer services to people who are vulnerable and meet them where they're at? As well as creating um, a bridge for the gaps for services to people who aren't accessing. The Moose is essentially a platform for nurses, doctors, social services, mental health, to support folks who are either vulnerable or in that place where they're not quite sure if they want to go into a brick and mortar building. You know, when folks have been traumatized by the system or, you know, maybe they've been in the hospital when they're young and, and that was traumatizing for them all the way to residential school type settings. The fear around not knowing what to expect or someone saying they're going to do something and not having the ability to follow through or that fear around what's going to happen if I tell them my story. Am I gonna lose something? Um, a lot of times we run into people who are in the midst of a crisis and it, it can take longer to get them to the sort of help they want. And if it's not easy and is as accessible, um, they tend to kind of turn down that sort of help. But with the Moose Van right downtown during our foot patrols, uh, it's really effective. Leanne is a vibrant, energy-filled person with some great ideas and a great vision. And I think it was that energy that put the Moose Van together and made it an actual reality. I feel like Canada has always been known as a quote unquote free country. However, we've had our struggles, we've had our problems, we've had so much pain and genocide. I would like to see Canada be 
another platform where folks can come together, you know, disregarding the color of their skin, their gender, how they identify, and just have the ability to come back and, and change the word of human. My dream, my desire is that we're able to come together differently as a community. It's important to know that as humans, it's not one person that makes a difference, it's all of us. This is a project that is about everyone. So I just feel that we need to be more mindful. We don't know what's happening for people and we don't know what has happened for people. If we were just a little kinder, you know, if we were just able to kind of stop and think for five seconds, how do we gain trust with people that have been so traumatized by so many systems? This is where maybe this is a small step because it's a bit of a system, but it's not the same system that we've utilized for years and years and years. You know, it's about being open. It's about saying, thank you for being here. I'm here. What do you need? Imagine extending grace and understanding to those brave enough to allow themselves to be seen, drenched in their authenticity. Imagine all of the ways that we are connected, if not by the rivers that bleed through the land, then by the complexity of the simplest things, such as our breath. With every expansion of the chest, we may cultivate space for each of us to release love. Listen to how the oceans cradle us and hear how we may allow each other to be cared for without resistance or judgment. Hold space for the stories that speak of courage and of pain, of love and of destruction, of healing and of death. There is space for us to acknowledge all that the land and its children have been made to bear witness to. Sharing our stories is an act of kindness, but do not always rush to fill the space with our craving to feel heard. Remember that the quality of listening a story receives is just as significant as the tale being told. There is power in the action of acceptance and the effortlessness of allowing. Empathy, perhaps, is the softness of the flowing river until it rushes in as purposeful as waterfalls, almost in absolute silence. There is a collective responsibility to understand the true nature of life in discovering the truths of who we are and where we have come from and how we may continue to be embraced. I create music instruments that have a certain quality in their sound. My feet become roots and just go down and connect to the core of the planet. And I imagine that every blow on my heart is actually permeating, moving, pressing, molding, expanding the metal disc. It has to be done over and over and over again. It's the sound that tells me where I am and where I need to go and how much more work I need to do. And so once I take it through that stage, I turn it around and whatever I did to expand and bring it back in by hammering on, uh, on the surface. And through my, my will force, is just permeating the metal with the energy that I'm connecting with through the singing. I hold the conception and belief and knowledge that there is no part of ourselves, you know, physically at least, that is not part of this planet. We're just made of the same material. In a sense, it's like a, our uh, essence, um, some people call it spirit, uh, the source aspect of ourselves is borrowing 
the material from this planet to have a human experience. So I connect with that energy and I hold this energy, I allow this energy to permeate me because I want the instruments that I create to hold the healing energy of our planet. Now, once the gong is flat, I just basically turn the rim. So it's got a little bit of a curve and that's the beginning of the tuning process. Bringing the sound in and just, you know, making it more uh, contained. I move from the anvil to a table, which has got silica sand in it. So I position a hammer in the center of the gong. And with another hammer, I just create a, a nibble right in the middle of the gong. So what that does is alters the pitch of uh, the, the core sound of the gong and it just come, makes it come to the fore. It's almost like they have a spirit, soul and, and body. So every gong has uh, like a tonality to itself which is given by the uh, harmonic sequence that you find within the structure of the sound of the gong. So you have a core tone, then as you move towards the periphery, you have different tones that come in. And then, and then the sustain of the gong, how long it lasts, is more like a, its physical body. Also, I listen to the tone. There is a lot of aliveness in the tone, a lot of vibration. So, so. Essentially, this is, uh, this is almost ready. I need to bake it and then make a holder and a mallet and then it's ready to go. After the gong is tuned, I bring heat to it. I bake it. It just crystallizes all the work that I've done, just you know, solidifies it, encases it within the structure of the gong. And when you play the gong in a space, it's like it really expands and just totally permeates. My passion is essentially of creating something that is in harmony and tuned in with our planet, with our career, with what's holding space for us. It is a passion and it is something that I want to do to be able to feel connected. Imagine a deeply cultivated mindfulness the space it requires to be present exists in the abundance of the land. It is at times challenging for us to imagine the vastness of ourselves, but we may come to understand it in the diversity and tenderness of the land that stretches from far and wide, that knows no boundary as it spills and rolls and dips into itself allowing us to sing and dance and rejoice in the crevice of its being. As we are nourished by the land, what do we give? And still, we are accepted. As this land, a living thing, recognizes itself in all that is breathed as it is breathed, by the veins of the rivers and the lungs of the trees and the heart of the oceans. So when I was a kid, I really wanted to be a golf pro. And I was competitive and really that's what I wanted to be. And then my father gave me his camera and I went to Lake Placid and I picked up the camera. I took my first photo in a place close to where we are today. And I knew instantly that I wanted to be a photographer. I wanted to be a nature photographer, but I also knew that that wasn't going to be an easy task right off the go um, in my career. So. I, uh, I came back and I said I wanted to be a photographer. During the time in my university and college, I started my, my business. I started in the film industry, so I understand the filming aspect and video. Not many people were in that uh, field at the time, in the middle range. You know, there was high end in, in the production end and there were very low end cameras that were available. So I came out of school with the intention of being my own boss, being my own my own business person and um, having my own business in photography 
but I knew that I had to work a little bit harder at, at gaining the reputation. I was very young and I was a woman, which was an, a very easy task to, to combine both of those and be taken seriously. So I, um, I began my career in, in video production and then as I got known and I was able to get myself out in the community, then I started to bring the photography aspect into it. Uh, it, it took a few years to get to where I am right now and 30 some years later I'm able to really do what I love and, and it's be out here with, with the wild creatures and the beautiful scenery and try to create images that can help people see the world that we have to, to live in and that we do live in and, and hopefully encourage them to go out into nature and experience and, and appreciate what we have. I've always loved nature. I'm uh, obviously massively uh, passionate and I would say slightly obsessed with, with nature and wild creatures and even when you have a squirrel running up to you or a chickadee behind you, whatever animal it is, it can be a polar bear to a small bird, I, I just feel a connection to them and I, I, I love people and I love photographing people but when I'm out in nature and you can hear the birds sing and you can see the beauty all around us it just is so connective and and i wish more people went out for walks and i think during covid that's what a lot of people have done and they've started to experience what we have in our own backyards i've always had a passion for nature my parents were birders and we traveled and camped all across canada so they were always encouraging us to be outside and their passion for birds, I think, transcended to all of us. And it meant going out and it meant the search. It meant the, you know, the going out and the hunt for, for these little creatures that live amongst us and to learn about their behavior, to learn about species. And I have a young son, so, you know, if right from the get-go with him, we'd go out birding and we would feed the chickadees and we'd connect him to nature in a way that we knew he would always appreciate. And I think it's so important for all of us to, to see and appreciate what we have to lose if we don't take better care of our planet. I have traveled all over the world. I've, been, I've photographed, I've visited seven continents, um, but I think my favorite place is Canada. It's ultimately where I come back and to all the time and you know, discovering my own backyard and spending more time um, just discovering little trails around my, my home city or um, you know, even if I had a choice, I would stay in Canada and you know, the Arctic is is the best kept secret of, of the world, I think. And I know it's not easy and accessible to many people to visit the Arctic, but um, you know, it, it's a place that is so full of tradition and culture, history, and from the people to the landscape to the wildlife, it's extraordinary. But I, I think ultimately Canada is my absolute favorite place to photograph. You know, you ultimately we're always looking for that bucket shot, that, that defining image as a photographer. And I've had a few, and, and one is of a spirit bear, a Kermode bear up in the Great Bear Rainforest last two years ago. And uh, I was able to be, you know, mere feet away from him. And he came up and he put his head under the water. And of course they're fishing for salmon, but he put his head under the water for quite some time. And I hadn't seen this behavior before. And he was standing, it was like he, he, he saw me on the river's edge and he came up and he stood right in front of me and he put his head under the water and then he lifted his head and he shook. And what he was doing was feeding on the salmon row at the bottom of the rivers. I think the next great, great photo for me is whatever's in front of me. So there are places that I want to visit, there's animals that I want to photograph. Um, I want to explore more of Canada too and, and try to tell the stories, the hidden gems like the herring run in, in BC and um, maybe explore a little bit more of Yukon and the Northwest Territories. So how I imagine my Canada in the future is brighter and better. We have so much to learn from over the, in the past and the history that now that I see that my 16 year old is growing into this young man, I want the future to be brighter and better for all Canadians. We have a lot to lose if we don't take better care of this planet. And I think we're learning along the way the importance of protecting our planet and galvanizing together as, as a whole 
we have the ability to make our Canada better and brighter. How can you not be astounded by nature and these creatures that offer us these opportunities, even a red squirrel? As long as he doesn't jump on my back. <laughs> that kind of freaked me out. <laughs> Imagine this land as it lays itself bare, unapologetically, as the rain pours and the oceans thrash up against us, as the land remains present and unaffected by our perceptions of it. Imagine this land as it teaches us of life, of how things are often everything all at once. The more deeply we immerse ourselves in her reflection, the more clarity will come. As the sun rises, unaffected, we may come to understand ourselves. As the sun rises, so too rises another day for us to shine. The land teaches us of our light, even as the trees are rustled by the whistling of the winds and their leaves all fade to color before falling to their knees, painting a picture of the world almost completely at peace. As the solstice brings the life around us to rest, we are reminded that nothing is truly that separate or lasting, that in all of our stories, this land is the only thing that's always ever been, allowing us to sing and dance and love and rest. It is that very nature of allowing that we must begin to reflect as the seasons pass and the land allows itself to let go again, so too should we allow the passing of our emotions. As the cherry blossoms whisper sweetly under the smile of the crescent moon, opening themselves as a frost melts again in the morning, they bloom mischievously, only to be mourned as we are braced by the sun that rises unaffected. Kind of hid for a while my Aboriginal culture. It was a search for identity. Just because I come from this tiny little town, just because I'm Aboriginal or two-spirited, it doesn't mean that the glass ceiling can't be shattered. I know there's room for me. That's awesome. Thank you so much. To see this room, a room full of people who came to see my work, it was, it was like walking on air. You know, just the, the immense amount of, of support and love and the acknowledgement, it was, it was the ultimate validation. <laughs> You're welcome. Levi Nelson grew up just north of Pemberton, BC, in Lillooet Nation, where his family's passion to preserve First Nations culture sparked his creativity and brought out his artistic side. My great-grandmother, Edlina, left it to my mom to carry on the tradition of like dancing and regalia making, like leather work. So I kind of grew up on my mom's um, sewing room floor. He started making doll dresses for his sister's Barbie dolls and he would come and give me a hug and he'd say, Mom, one day I'm gonna be famous and then you won't have to work anymore. <laughs> Everything was for us. And so seeing how hard she worked, it made me want to give back to her, to be able to, to take care of her one day. Before one can take care of others, many say one must first take care of themselves. I always kind of struggled with my own um, issues with identity and not feeling good enough. I went through this really depressed stage where one day my teacher just said, I want you to know that, you know, being Aboriginal and being, um, you know, gay and being a teenager, those are three really wonderful things and you should be proud of that. And nobody had ever told me that before. Like up until then, uh, those three things were for me something to be ashamed of. So in the complete opposite you know, an adult, a female, uh, you know, a white person told me that it was okay to be who I was. It just, it, it, it was okay. It took a long time for me to find pride in my own culture and way of life. There was the Aboriginal Youth Ambassador Program through the Squamish Little Cultural Center. 
and learning to introduce myself in my Ukulmich language and standing in the circle with my people and singing our traditional songs and dancing and then showing that to the world and having them admire our culture was sort of a gateway into me saying, wow, this is something to be proud of and I love that. To be able to share my culture is just, it was a gift. And then it was time for him to share his gift with the world. While searching for his identity, he realized that throughout his life, he had always been painting. I decided to put together a portfolio and apply to Emily Carr University, and I got in. A lot of my work incorporates a lot of my own personal feelings and beliefs, and it addresses identity and what happened to my people through the assimilation process and, and, and the government stepping in and interfering with cultural practices like language and dance and traditional way of life. I want my work to be able to have a message to also be a source of strength um, for other Aboriginal people. In terms of the peace uh, nations in urban landscapes, that was a very nice surprise for me in the fact that after meeting him, I encouraged him to come by the museum and we set him up to do sketching of all our historic masks. And then when I saw this work, I noticed that he had incorporated three of those masks into this street scene, which resembles the downtown east side of uh, Vancouver. So it was a, a very fascinating hybrid of the past and the present. He has a, a very bright future. Now, in his final year at Emily Carr, everything seemed to come together. Having my own exhibit, especially in Whistler, in my, in my own big backyard, it's, it's the ultimate um, validation of all the work that I've done leading up to this point, all the painting, the tireless hours in the studio, and 16-hour days, and then being able to show all of these people who have come just to see my work. The, the it's, there, it's the ultimate high. I knew that it would happen someday, <laughs> that he would be, be famous. I'm really happy and proud of him. I, he's come a long way, and he, yes, he has found himself. It's just amazing to be able to have a voice uh, finally in today's day and age um, that was silenced for a long time. This is who I am coming through my work. If I die tomorrow, I'd be happy. <laughs> Imagine our capacity to create, to allow the full expression of our being to pierce the hearts of others. Just as the sky paints itself in violet hues and we bask in awe of the sunset, the taste almost of citrus, as the sun wakes and rests, same as the chest rises and falls. Imagine being at ease with the fullness of our identity, just as the mountains crash through the clouds with full intensity. So too are we lifted by the land, grounded in the wisdom of the trees that breathe into us as we enter the openness ablaze. Imagine where we may belong in the midst of it all, as we surrender ourselves to the gentleness of the river that ripples under the caress of the birds congregating in silence as they bend the air before us. Remember, same as the soil that lays at our feet, we are sacred with a story and breath of our own. In the reflection of the land, we are free in our wholeness. Traveling for me is the most valuable life experience you can ever have. I'm originally born and raised in Germany and I came to Canada in 2008 and ever since it has been my home for me. the best when you start hearing the sound of boiling water. 
My name is Melanie Vogel. I'm currently hiking the Cray Trail, also formerly known as the Transcanada Trail from Cape Spear in Newfoundland to Victoria in British Columbia. For me, travel means creating stories, meeting people, learning about the culture and tradition of a country, and also experiencing your true self. Good morning, everyone. I woke up way too late. I find only on the road you can be uh, the best of yourself, and that's a wonderful thing to experience. Yeah, it's all wet from my breath. <laughs> Minus five degree came with a little bit of surprise. But it's beautiful outside. I did survival training. I ran. I uh, biked. I uh, read up on through hikers and their experiences. Um, I read up on bear safety, um, on how to survive the winter in Canada but you can really only uh, prepare so much for it. The rest is actually all either learning by doing it or, and, and actually mostly bringing the right mindset to the trail. Time to get up, make coffee. No, wait, I don't have coffee anymore. Are you coming with me? Hiking across Canada? <laughs> mm. Yeah, I will see. <laughs> so far I've been uh, almost one and a half years and over 6,000 kilometers into this journey. I started uh, my journey last year, June 2nd. And yes, it can be quite exhausting. Um, there's um, a lot of challenges that I have to face. Like courage, so is fear a constant companion with me on this journey. It doesn't mean that I'm necessarily attached to fear. I actually learned that in nature, fear is allowed to pass. However, in moments of perceived danger, it's fear that's keeping me highly alert, cautious, and um, observative. So this is 2000 men who think this is fun to make awful jokes. Or maybe it's not even a joke. <laughs> towards women. There was one moment in this journey, just this summer, where a man approached me inappropriately. And it's this kind of fear that a lot of women can relate to because it's so ingrained into a women's psyche. And that is the fear of men. Oh, well, you're not staying with me. And I come and look for you later, knowing that I'm just about to go in, into the woods. It's not about that risk itself or the challenge itself. This scares me. This scares me. You know what this is? This is a big shit. And you know what? This is for you. This is... It's how you take it, how you react to it, and how you handle it, how you are prepared for it. Thank you, wonderful people in Quebec. <laughs> Province number six. Hello, Ontario. <laughs> if everything would run smooth and perfect, then it would be quite boring and I would have no stories to tell, but it's those risks that you're taking that spice up the, the, whole, the whole trip, yeah. After days and days and days and days and days, of gray sky it turned blue today it's a good day to meet the spirit of terry fox it's a good day to celebrate one and a half years on the trail and it's a good day to finish my stretch uh, or my walk along lake superior I've met people on my journey who asked me, so you're taking two or even three years 
out of your life. This experience is such an incredible life lesson that you can't buy. Right now I'm facing a new challenge, going into a adventure in the prairies. I'm not sure if I can do it. I may have to stop, but I want to try. I planned uh, this journey to take about two years, but now that I'm in this journey, um, it will probably take two and a half or even three years. Uh, one of the reasons being that um, in uh, Edmonton, I can make the decision to go up north to the Arctic Ocean. And ever since I'm in this journey, I'm more and more um, drawn to this idea to really walk from ocean to ocean to ocean, like from the Atlantic to the Arctic to the Pacific Ocean. Imagine the privilege we hold in being planted here as we are overwhelmed by the beauty of it all, while the land gracefully includes us, while we cultivate our lives on fertile soil. This land is one of opportunity as freedom flows in from the Atlantic and washes up the rocks on the shore. Is it possible to be both grounded and drowned all at once, I've wondered before. If everyone feels like that, at times, breathless, how powerful it would be if we each had a chance at catching our own breath. If we could stop for just a moment and consider each other in the simplest of ways. If we could match each other's rhythm. How there might be pain in that, profoundly so that catches us like the roaring winds of a storm and then releases us by the wisdom of allowing. There is room for us to acknowledge the things that keep us up at night. We may find what frightens us the most is refusing to name our fears. There is enough light for us to shine it on those things that creep up from the darkness of the sea. And still, there will remain space for us to cultivate joy, to recognize that life is intimately as it is, welcoming us to live just as we are. I'm Uzma Jalal Bean. I'm a high school teacher uh, in one of the Toronto boards, and I'm also a writer. So I wrote these two novels, I Shot Last and Hannah Khan Carries On. They're both romantic comedies uh, set inside a close-knit Toronto Muslim community. When I was in university, I just realized that all of my extra jobs had to do with teaching. I was just always tutoring kids, or I was working as a camp counselor, and I realized I just really like to people. I like chatting with students, I like working with parents, uh, and it's a job that I really enjoy. So I was born and raised in Canada, and uh, specifically I grew up in the east end of Toronto, in Scarborough. And Scarborough was a very diverse, immigrant-rich neighborhood. I grew up surrounded by people who had come to this country from all over the place. So I grew up around multi multiple different uh, cultures. I attended public schools in Toronto, uh, and I feel like a lot of my global yet local upbringing is a result of that. Um, I live with my parents, and my parents immigrated from India in the 1970s. So they, they actually arrived, my mom has a story, she says that she flew into Toronto and saw the, the CN Tower come, uh, being built. So that, that's um, how long ago they came in. And when they came to Toronto, because they didn't have any family here, the community became their family. So they were very active in um, the mosque, uh, 
building the Islamic Foundation of Toronto and the building behind me, the Islamic Institute of Toronto. Uh, and that sense of community was really passed down to me and my younger brother. The sense of just giving back to the community, being part of the community, uh, being productive and you know being a good citizen was really drilled into me from a young age. And I hope my children will also uh, take that to heart. I'm Canadian and I'm really happy and grateful to be Canadian uh, and my children are Canadian and I'm so my mom always says thank God we moved to Canada instead of staying in the United States the US is a great country but I think we're a lot happier here a lot of the themes that I write about in my novels are about family and community so both of my novels are set in Scarborough uh, and sort of inspired by my own upbringing. So I grew up, as I said, in a very close-knit uh, community, close-knit neighborhood, and uh, I, I felt very comfortable there. I felt as if I belonged. The fact that I am a visible Muslim, the fact that I wear a hijab on my head, has impacted basically every aspect of my life. I started wearing hijab when I was 14 years old. Uh, it was a very personal decision. I choose to remain a visible Muslim woman, someone who does wear hijab, uh, because my faith is very important to me. And I'm very fortunate to live in a country where overall we do have a sense of uh, religious freedom. And um, I walk with my faith every single day. And sometimes I don't even think about it because it's become such a big part of my life. And sometimes other people remind me about it because of the hurtful things that I, sometimes people say to me. Um, but it is part of who I am. Uh, removing it would feel strange. I hope that my work resonates with readers across the country as well as hopefully around the world uh, because I write joyful, optimistic stories about people of color. Um, my characters have nuance, my stories are funny, uh, they resonate with a lot of people because they make them laugh and they ultimately are very optimistic. The horrific murder of the Ufsil family in London, Ontario a few weeks ago completely devastated uh, the Muslim community uh, locally as well as across the country. After the six, six men were murdered and uh, were gunned down in cold blood when they were um, praying in a mosque a few years ago in Quebec, and then to have a family out for a walk, which is such a normal everyday thing, especially during times of COVID, uh, to be murdered uh, for no other reason other than someone had decided that they looked visibly Muslim and therefore deserve to die is a sobering reality of some of the hatred that does exist and simmer just beneath the surface in Canada. It's not part of my Canada uh, and I hope that it will, this incident will trigger a lot of soul searching uh, of the impact of the toxic narrative about certain communities uh, in, in Canada. Christian, Buddhist, everyone together today to... One of the things I've always loved about Canada, my country, is that uh, I think at heart a lot of Canadians, most Canadians, do have that sense of community. I hope that as we continue and grow as a nation that we will keep that in mind. Let's take care of each other, let's be kind to each other, and let's recognize that we are all part of this great nation. There is a truth that exists in the experience of being uprooted and then born again, some place that reminds you of how much you do not belong. Imagine how often we seem to forget that wherever we stand, we are planted once more. There is a feeling you carry when pieces of yourself are at rest in the ocean, a feeling of being weighed somewhere on the edge of. And still the land embraces you where the water meets the shore. By the abundance of the soil and the grace of the morning sun, you cultivate anew and plant the remains of old roots from which you once grew. There is a story buried in the lives of the diasporic, a history so deep and dark, so twisted and misconstrued, so woven by strength and love and despair. Though the waters continue to welcome us and wash our bodies up like treasures from the ocean's floor, blue and crimson and broken yellow sea glass we come together to build a mosaic. 
listen to us bloom and hear our song of resilience. Listen to us dance and heal as we stand to break the height of the waves crashing in all around us. Soyez les fous ou fanatiques, à peut être loup, la rhétorique, la démagogie, les paroles ou ça pique, tu fais le sage ou l'amnésie. Mon nom est Yao Vikoui et mon nom d'artiste est Yao. Je suis originaire du Togo et né en Côte d'Ivoire. Je suis arrivé au Canada en 1999. J'étais en Côte d'Ivoire à ce moment-là. Je suis arrivé, j'avais je l'âge de 12-13 ans à peu près. Mon arrivée au Canada a été plus ou moins une surprise. Ou pas plus ou moins une surprise, a été une surprise. Parce que lorsque je suis arrivé au Canada, je ne savais pas que je venais pour rester au Canada. Ça a été essentiellement avec les événements qui se passaient en Côte d'Ivoire à ce moment-là. Ça a été un mouvement familial, toute la famille, mais ça, ça a été sur une idée, on part en vacances. Tu sais, on, nos parents nous ont dit qu'on partait en vacances, en fait. Euh, donc, on est parti en plein milieu de la nuit, euh, on a pris l'avion, sans trop savoir où est-ce qu'on allait. Euh, et les fiches d'embarquement étaient remplies par les parents. Et puis, on arrive à Amsterdam, on fait la journée à Amsterdam, et ensuite, allez hop, on arrive à Montréal. De Montréal, on prend un bus, on arrive à Ottawa, on se retrouve dans un appartement. Euh, tu dors par terre tes premières nuits et une semaine après, je demande à mes parents quand est-ce qu'on repart et mes parents me répondent « repart ». Vous commencez les cours dans trois semaines. <rire> C'est comme ça que je me suis retrouvé à Ottawa et euh, 22 ans plus tard, je suis encore là. Euh, donc ça a été… Euh, C'est comme ça que je suis arrivé. Bref. Dans un monde de fabulation, bientôt à en perdre la mémoire, du pied des deux avait raison. Déjà aussi à l'école, ça a été très difficile déjà au début. Euh, on s'entend, j'arrivais, je viens d'une autre culture, je, 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 on, me, on me faisait comprendre que j'avais un autre français aussi, un français international. Donc il y avait une autre culture franco-ontarienne aussi à laquelle je, je m'étais, que je ne connaissais pas du tout. Euh, dans la cour de récré, ça parle anglais, en classe, ça parle français. Donc il y avait, ça n'a pas été facile. Ça n'a pas été facile comme intégration au début. Et ironiquement, moi, mon intégration hein, s'est faite par le biais de l'art. Euh, Aujourd'hui, je dirais, pour moi, quand je dis que la musique, c'est un outil de changement social, euh, c'est parce que on arrive à... Je, je dis souvent que je suis chanceux comme artiste parce qu'un artiste a une voix, un artiste a un public, un artiste a des gens qui sont prêts à l'écouter. Donc oui, c'est important d'utiliser cette plateforme. Pour, bon, on utilise cette plateforme pour divertir les gens, mais c'est aussi important d'utiliser cette plateforme pour parler de choses qui nous importunent, de choses qui nous rassemblent ou de choses qui nous dérangent tous ensemble. Donc aujourd'hui, moi, pour moi, ma, ma musique, c est, c est, c est, le thème central à ma musique, c'est l'humain. C'est l'humain, c'est les émotions, c'est ce qu'on vit, c'est ce que je vis, c'est ce que les gens autour de moi vivent. C'est les réalités communes qu'on a que moi je me permets de mettre en musique, c'est les émotions communes qu'on a que je me permets de mettre en musique. Donc autant que je vais parler de, de racisme, de sexisme dans les chansons, que autant que je vais parler de faire la fête et de, et de danser, autant que je vais parler de rêver par exemple au futur, de, de, de ce qu'on veut, de qu veut devenir demain, etc. Et je ne me limite pas justement à, à un thème spécifique, je, je prends vraiment l'humain au central et je me dis Qu'est-ce qu'on vit tous ensemble euh, C'est sûr que quand je dis que ma musique a, a trait vraiment à, à l'environnement social dans lequel je suis, je sais par exemple que l'une des chansons que j'écris euh, et qui a, qui, a, qui a beaucoup marqué les gens, c'est « Étrange absurdité » où je parle de cette réalité d'être noir au Canada par exemple et, 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 et de me questionner à savoir est-ce qu'on est si loin de nos voisins du Sud et de tout ce qu'on voit aussi nos voisins du Sud et comment est-ce que ça se reflète ici et mon expérience en tant que telle qui a été autant positive, j'ai eu des qui a été très positive en général, mais il y a eu des moments aussi qui ont été très négatifs et, et principalement en termes d'intégration. Ça a souvent été ça le problème, euh, de pouvoir arriver dans un lieu, éviter les stéréotypes, que ce soit même dans l'industrie de la musique. Quand j'ai commencé, de, de, déjà dès que tu, 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 tu dis je fais de la musique, automatiquement on dit ah tu fais du rap parce qu'on regarde ta carrure, on regarde ton visage, on regarde ta couleur de peau, puis on dit tu fais du rap. Non, je fais un peu plus que du rap, comprenez. On, on a besoin de travailler dix mille fois plus pour pouvoir prouver être au même niveau que les autres ou pour pouvoir prouver que nos intentions sont bonnes ou quoi que ce soit. Moi, moi j'estime que le Canada, le Canada est, est un pays et, et au futur, j'ai l'espère parce qu'on voit comment le Canada change. Je regardais les statistiques qui disent qu'il y a plus de 250 ethnies au Canada. Et Morin disait, si nous cultivions les convergences plutôt que les différences, il y aurait la paix dans le monde. Et je pense que moi, ce que je vois dans le futur du Canada, c'est vraiment cette communication-là. C'est d'ouvrir les chantiers de communication crus. 
que ce soit positif ou négatif, mais qu'on puisse en parler. La première étape pour régler un problème est réaliser qu'il y en a un. Et qu'on puisse rejoindre toutes ces communautés-là. Parce que je pense qu'il y a beaucoup, du fait qu'on est plusieurs, il y a beaucoup de ghettoisation, où c'est très sectaire, où c'est très communautaire. Mais je pense qu'on a tous à gagner, à, à échanger, à partager, à comprendre c'est quoi les réalités des autres. Parce qu'on dit, on, on, a peur de, on, a juste, on a peur de ce qu'on ne connaît pas. Donc plus je te connais, plus, et, et on a besoin d'être exposé au moins dix fois à quelque chose pour que ça devienne familier. Et je pense que c'est quelque chose qu'on devrait, dans le futur, j'espère voir plus. J'espère voir plus de ces mélanges-là, plus de ces échanges-là entre les différentes communautés qui, qui enrichissent ce merveilleux pays qui est le Canada. Pourtant je t'ai dans la peau et je t'ai dans le cœur. Étrange, étranger, absurde, absurdité. Unis dans la solitude collective de nos unions sans aucune perspective. En un index, en un clin d'œil. Nouveau symbole national d'une partielle journée de deuil. Des histoires racontées que personne n'arrive à expliquer. Des bouts de nouvelles que l'on a tricotés. Une couverture qui n'offre aucun abri. J'ai beaucoup d'espoir pour le Canada. Je, je, je pense qu'on on a, on a tout à gagner. Beaucoup de positivisme dans, dans, dans ce que je vois pour l'avenir du Canada aussi. Et je pense que aussi longtemps que la société civile et nos politiciens, on continue d'avoir des dialogues et on continue à échanger et qu'on pense vraiment à, au bien-être de l'ensemble de et non à nos intérêts personnels, je pense qu'on a... Et au Canada, je le vois souvent, on, on est capable d'avoir certaines conversations qui sont difficiles à avoir. Et ça, ça pour moi, c'est le bon signe que, qu on, qu on, qu on va, que ça va aller. Comme je dis, la première étape pour résoudre un problème, réaliser qu'il y en a un. Et si on est capable de réaliser qu'on a un problème avec les communautés autochtones, qu'on a un problème avec les communautés racisées, si on est capable de réaliser tout ça et d'avoir ces conversations qu'on fait en ce moment, eh bien, j'estime que oui, euh, on est déjà sur le droit chemin. Ouvre tes oreilles, pensez soleil. This land is a symbol of hope, of the courage it takes for us to open our hearts and to experience life as it is, not simply how we've imagined it to be. Life exists in the simplest moments, in the kindness we extend to our neighbors, in finding what was once lost, in the laughter shared between old friends, and the patience it takes to cultivate true self-love. We carry within us the wisdom of the land that plants us all as equals and waters us generously as we grow. Be kind to yourself and accept others as they are. Be inspired by those around you who ignite others with their light. Take time to rest and to reflect. Hear the truth that permeates the noise and listen to us sing and dance and rejoice and hear how we are loved. There is hope in our capacity to reconnect, to cultivate our communities through a reconceptualization of this land and of our relationship to it, to our own genuine authenticity and unique contribution to the cycle of life. For as long as the land offers us the mercy of regeneration, there remains hope for our capacity to heal and to do so collectively. Imagine this Canada.